Okay, we're online. So I'll just uh, say hello to everybody. Um, today we are going to uh, combine us in, in a very good idea, actually, because the doctors and pharmacists, the young doctors and pharmacists together. Timothy is our expert. He's he's amazing person. He's going to talk about antimicrobial resistance and antimicrobial stewardship. Um, uh, so today I just combine uh, basically faculty of pharmacy with faculty of medicine, and I can welcome my students from the from our medical school. Uh, the Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski University. So thank you very much for, for your presence. Timothy, so please kindly introduce yourself. Uh, tell us about, uh, about your experience and uh, just a small brief of introduction. Uh, yeah. What are you going to talk about today? So uh, my name's Tim McGlagan. I'm a ID pharmacist here in Moncton, New Brunswick, Canada. Um, I have a regional role in supporting infectious disease and antimicrobial stewardship from a pharmacy department as well as uh, with ID physicians for our RHA, Horizon Healthcare Network. Uh, so half my time is spent supporting antimicrobial stewardship initiatives, and we don't have a fully developed program yet, but certain projects we're trying to work on and quality improvement in the area of antimicrobial stewardship, developing guidelines, uh, monitoring resistance, uh, clinical core sets, and some of that I'll show you some of the projects we've done today. Uh, and then the other part of my time is working with our local IT physicians uh, on the inpatient consult service, rounding with them on patients, and also uh, supporting any questions that may come from the pharmacy staff, locally, regionally, as well as uh, the medical staff uh, when they have questions related to patient care and, and microbial therapy. So that's Excellent. a really quick introduction. <laughs> And we have to we have to just say at the beginning that um, all these uh, uh, problems with the antimicrobial resistance is, 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 is very common around the world, and it's very important to have a very integrated um, local or, or global policy uh, yeah. about this problem. Um, it's approximately around 10 to 20 percent of deaths in Poland uh, uh, regarding the, the infections in the hospital. So what can we do? We are going to actually know today from Timothy. So we can I think go to our presentation. Uh, Timothy, and uh, please share your screen. And I will just ask questions in the end. Obviously, everybody is welcome to ask questions as well after we finished. Okay. Can you see my screen? Okay. Uh, not yet. I'm just waiting. Okay. Just let me know when you can. Sure. Not yet. So you have to. I think you have to click. Oh, about to share yeah. again. Screen again. Yeah. Not to worry. Technologies. Yeah. <laughs> It's a pain sometimes. Share the screen and pick up the window and it should work. And then place, place a full screen on the app. Ah, fabulous, it works, super. Does it work? Good. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, <laughs> all right, technology is not my strong point. All right, so I'll just get started if everyone can see. So today we're gonna go over an intro to antimicrobial stewardship and, and a little bit on what can I do, where do I start? Uh, whether this is your own individual practice in pharmacy, and a little bit of a touch of where that may be at a program level, uh, but, but just touching on a bit of both. Uh, so myself, again, I, I introduce myself and uh, Tim McGlag, and I, I work in Horizon Health Network. It's in New Brunswick, Canada. We're the largest health authority in New Brunswick, our province here. It's the second largest in Atlantic Canada, so this region of Canada. Uh, Horizon operates 12 hospitals and more than 100 medical facilities, and Pharmacy Services here has a staff of about 240 working in 11 of those facilities. Um, of the hospitals, most of them are small regional uh, rural hospitals, I should say. We really only have four main regional hospitals, um, and we have infectious disease services in three of the four main regional uh, the tertiary care sites. Uh, regionally, we have three pharmacists with time dedicated to ID and antimicrobial stewardship, hoping to grow that to a fourth here shortly. Uh, but again, we're, we're still in the early phases of this. We don't really have a fully functioning antimicrobial stewardship program. We have committees and some resources and guideline structures, but we're still trying to work on bringing this all together. So for all of us, it's, it's often a work in progress. I don't have any disclosures to make for this presentation. Other than that, any of the local work and projects that I'm presenting, it's really a team effort. It's not my work alone. Uh, this is things I've been done with pharmacists, colleagues in Horizon and our other RHA in New Brunswick Vitality, uh, another colleague of mine, Dan Landry, we, we've often teamed on a lot of these projects and try to do them in both our RHAs, uh, as well as ID physicians we work with in our local area and non-ID physicians, medical microbiologists, and, and many others and students and residents. Uh, often it's really students and residents that help us get these projects done. And 
uh, the, the fresh open minds to new ideas and, and opportunities. Um, so what I'm hoping to do with this presentation is that after attending it, you'll be able to explain what is anti-microbial stewardship and its key interventions, describe the importance of anti-microbial stewardship to society uh, locally and as a whole, and also to the patient we're treating right in front of us, describe the role of the pharmacist in anti-microbial stewardship, but specifically looking at in the hospital, and identify some key stewardship interventions that you may implement in your local hospital-based practice, as well as metrics and how do you measure uh, the interventions and just give you a little bit of an idea of what we did there. So when we look at infectious disease, I mean, it wasn't that long ago in the 1960s and 70s, we actually thought we had won the battle. That was a bit of a popular thought, not all, but some had this thought. And it was actually a Sir Frank McFarland Burnett who won the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1960 that said, one could think of the middle of the 20th century as the end of the, one of the most important social revolutions, the virtual elimination of infectious disease as a significant factor in social life. Well, we know that's not true. Uh, infectious disease remains will continue to be a significant factor in social life. At that time, they had antibiotics. They were in the golden age of antibiotics coming out. Vaccines were being used more. So I can see why they had that thought. But again, we know that's not how it played out. WHO lists of respiratory tract infections as the fourth leading cause of death globally. In Canada, influenza and pneumonia are listed as the seventh leading cause of death. And of course, we have the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, which certainly has affected social life for all of us and how we look at infectious disease. So some fun facts about bacteria, well, there's a lot of them. There's 5 million trillion trillion, so 5 times 10 to the 30th power. They make up 12% of the total biomass on Earth. They're everywhere from our gut to deep in the Earth's crust, in all extremes of environments with salinity, oxygen availability, and extremes of temperature. Their generation time is 20 to 30, 60 minutes. Ours is 25 to 30 years. They made antibiotics. We found them, and we found them only recently, 1928. The father of microbiology, he discovered protists and bacteria back in 1675. So if you look at our history uh, here on Earth, we've really not known about them and been treating them for that long compared to how long they've been around. Uh, you know, they've isolated resistance mechanisms of MRSA from bacteria that would not have ever been exposed in under ice caps and stuff. So it's it's been there a while. And uh, we're making it complicated by how much antibiotics we're using in our environment and populations. So I'm going to go over what antimicrobial stewardship is. So, so what it is, when you look at the official definitions, it's a coordinated effort to promote the judicious and effective use of antibiotics. This is includes but not limited to appropriate selection, dosing, routes, and duration. Uh, so an effective program will limit inappropriate and excessive use, but more importantly, improve and optimize therapy for the individual patient, as well as the population as a whole. This is kind of the long, drawn out definition. Really, it's the right drug at the right time, at the right dose for the right duration. Uh, much as pharmacists what we're doing for all patients. Antibiotic, it has, has an effect, not just for that patient, but the population as a whole. So it's making sure patients get the right antibiotics when they need them, but only when they need them for the right indication, the right duration. The primary goal is to optimize clinical outcomes. We want patients to do better, but also minimizing unintended consequences, such as toxicity in that patient, but also the selection of pathogenic organisms and the emergence of resistance. And that's where the population level concern comes in. The secondary goal is to reduce healthcare costs without adversely impacting quality of care. Again, that's a secondary goal that's often achieved. So we, when you look at antimicrobial stewardship interventions, also I'll act have the acronym AMS as I go through, uh, it's really developing and correcting a process in order to improve an outcome. So that patient clinical outcome, minimize toxicity, or improve resistance rates. And it will, I'll talk a little bit about the five R's. So again, that right drug, the right route, the right dose, the right duration at the right time, only when you need them, but promptly when you do. So when you look at the broad core base of interventions, uh, we have perspective audit and feedback, where we go out and look for inappropriate use and try to correct that use and make recommendations. We can also uh, control use by formulary restrictions and pre-authorizations by only allowing certain prescribers to prescribe or having to get permission. I'll, I'll show you a few examples of what we did here in New Brunswick. Other supplementary strategies are education, guidelines, pathways, antimicrobial order forms, streamlining, therapies, dose optimization, 
IV to PO conversion. So when a patient meets criteria to switch the oral route to, to do that, get away from the IV therapy. Uh, there's microbiology based interventions and reporting. So going with patients with certain positive cultures. Uh, there's computer surveillance and infection and syndrome specific interventions where you're identifying patients with a certain diagnosis. When you look at a lot of these strategies, a lot of them are keen to pharmacy. Uh, we're well placed as pharmacists to intervene in these areas of mm -hmm. education, supporting how good developing guidelines and pathways, and micro order forms, following patients and suggesting streamlining, optimizing a dose, again, IVPO conversion, uh, targeting certain infections and making recommendations to follow guideline therapy, and also during the order review and process. So I'll show a little bit of that later as well. Does it work? Well, yeah, it does. Studies have shown that we can decrease resistance. At one point here, our rates of uh, ciprofloxacin resistance amongst E. coli was 25%. With some interventions we've done, we've got that down to the, until CSI changed the breakpoint, it was down to as low as 15, 14%. Uh, but we have seen that certainly take a change in direction. It was rising for the 10 previous years. And over about five, six year process, it's come back down. Uh, decreased C. difficile infection can also be done. Decrease antimicrobial usage and cost. Improve appropriateness of use. Uh, one thing I'll show here, we actually found our readmission rates dropped uh, for a community-acquired pneumonia intervention we put in place. Some limitations are that we don't know the best strategy. Uh, there is a lack of randomized controlled tri trials, and often we test multiple interventions, so we don't really know which intervention worked. And, I'll show you another example of how we did that here when we implemented a bundle. Many studies focus on a process measure and they don't measure outcomes. So it's important to consider that if you're doing a project in a study, try to measure the outcome, not just improving a process. Um, but the optimal approach is to have a program that actively monitors antimicrobial resistance, enables appropriate antimicrobial use, and collaborates with infection control to control the spread of resistance. Uh, so often we actually, I work on our infection control committee as well as our stewardship committee to link those two. So why is it important? Why do we care about stewardship? Well, unlike most other drugs, the use of antibiotic in one patient can compromise the efficacy in another. Antibiotic resistance can cause infections of patients who've never received an antibiotic. So when you look at uh, ESBLs, a lot of here locally, what we find is patients coming with ESBLs, you know, gram negative bacteria that have expended uh, spectrum beta lactamases that even makes the phallosporins ineffective. Uh, they're coming from community never having been exposed to an antibiotic. Uh, Canadian experts estimate about 26% of infections or one in four are already resistant to our first line drugs. So hypertension can't spread to the next patient, but a multi drug resistant organism can. Uh, so these spread, I mean, when you look in our environment, we have susceptible bacteria as well as resistant bacteria. And like I said, these bacteria have never been exposed to antibiotics. Some of them have these resistant mechanisms hundreds of years back. But when you start exposing to a large amount of antibiotics, you select out the resistant strains, and they multiply and thrive. Uh, and they create clones identically resistant to, all the, to that antibiotic is what can happen. And they can pass this resistant mechanism on from one to another. Uh, so this is why we want to make sure we're only exposing the environment and our patients to them when they need them. So, you know, this little joke is about they can pass one to another while in the hospital kitchen. Uh, so it really is a global concern. It, it, it's, it's not just in one area. It, it's all across our uh, globe. Infections caused by resistant organisms can lead to increased healthcare costs, increased morbidity, mortality. Uh, it knows no Orders. It's in all our country. WHO has declared antimicrobial resistance as one of the top 10 global health care threats facing humanity. And that by 2050, the annual worldwide human deaths attributed to AMR could reach as high as 10 million, uh, overtaking deaths due to diabetes and cancer. And so, you I mean, if you look at North America and Europe, we'd be easily over half a million, uh, let alone other parts of the world like Africa, as, as many as 4 million yearly in Asia, 4 million. So, this is a huge threat. Uh, and, and so this is a quote I read, and it was really sobering that this in this article they quoted that it may become a reality that antibiotics were discovered and squandered within the living memory uh, of a single lifetime, a startling achievement of mankind. So, because penicillin was only discovered in the 1920s, and already the rates of resistance are startling. 
Uh, misuse and overuse are main drivers. About 60% of adult patients admitted to U.S. hospitals receive one dose of antibiotic during the stay, and about 50% of antimicrobial use is inappropriate. And I'll show you some of our local data where we're hitting nearly that 50% mark. Patients who receive these antibiotics are at risk of serious ADRs, and they have no clinical benefit from them. Uh, a 2018 Canadian Point Prevalence Survey of 38 hospitals we took place in this showed that the overall appropriateness was only 73%, ranging from 50, that low of 53, so nearly that 50%, to 80%. Um, and, and one thing I'd like to remark is what do patients expect for appropriateness of care when they come into our hospitals? Well, certainly higher than 53%. CDC, again, more than half the antibiotics prescribed for select events in hospital is not consistent with recommended prescribing guidelines. Uh, the prescribing is not supported in 79% of patients with community acquired pneumonia, 77% with urinary tract infections, uh, often with fluoroquinolones prescribed inappropriately. So again, recommending that you have a program and with prescribers as well as pharmacists, both working together to optimize antibiotic selection, to reassess antibiotic therapy when the results of diagnostic testing are available and use the shortest duration of therapy as possible. How are they misused? Well, there's a variety of ways. They can be given when they're not needed. They can be continued longer than they're necessary. They may be given at the wrong dose, not meeting optical. Uh, pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic targets. You might be using broad-spectrum agents to treat very susceptible bacteria, so not de-escalating based on your susceptibility. Uh, bug drug mismatch, so you have the wrong antibiotic, you have an antibiotic that is resistant. Uh, prolonged prophylactic therapy, a uh, big thing there is surgical prophylaxis, less than 24 hours or one dose pre-op and not continuing that post-op where it's not been shown to benefit. Treatment of a positive clinical culture, colonization in the absence of a true infection. So a big one there is asymptomatic bacteria or excessive use of certain antimicrobial agents. So we just have go-to agents we use consistently, uh, like Piperacillin and Tazobactam, uh, almost as if it's a vitamin. But, you know, use the antibiotic that's recommended, your first-line therapies, and not reaching for the same agent all the time, which pressures that one area. There's a lot of fallacies that support this inappropriate use and misuse. One is that broader is better. Uh, a failure to respond is a failure to provide coverage. When in doubt, change drugs or add another. More disease, more drugs. Sickness requires immediate treatment. A response implies a diagnosis. That's a big one. Local patient got better. It must have been the antibiotic. Bigger disease, bigger drugs, bigger disease, newer drugs, or antibiotics are non toxic. Uh, so, you know, in terms of broader is better. Hypercell and tazobactam doesn't work any better than a more narrow agent, such as penicillin, if it's susceptible to both phenolactams. And it's troubling, because again, I talked that back in the you know, 60s, 70s, 50s, we were in the golden age with antimicrobials coming out, not only waters for resistant organisms, but there's less new antimicrobial class, novel antimicrobial classes coming out with novel mechanisms of action, and we're in a bit of a discovery void. I know that some of these have been marketed but in terms of when they've been discovered, there's less and less being discovered as we move along. Uh, I know this is American data, but looking at the FDA, looking at novel medications, very few of them are, in fact, antibiotics, which is shown in red. <clears throat> Here in Canada, again, another thing you're making antimicrobial stewardship important is that it's a required organizational practice uh, to accredit our acute care facilities. So Accreditation Canada mandates that all acute care facilities have an antimicrobial stewardship program, and they have tests of compliance on that, that the program's been implemented, that it specifies who's accountable, that it's interdisciplinary. So it's this is really important. That includes pharmacists, physicians, but as well as nurses. They have a big role here, infection control and IT. Uh, it, it can't be all from one group. Uh, the program includes interventions to optimize antimicrobial use and that it's evaluated on an ongoing basis. Now, the, right now, these tests of compliance have a bit of a low-hanging bar that if you have committees and stuff, but over time, we hope that they raise this bar to, again, push our RHAs and facilities to invest more in this area in terms of human resources and technology. So what is our role? as pharmacists. So for this, I looked at our local Canadian Society of Hospital Pharmacists. They put out a position statement and it covers it well. It endorses that pharmacists are integral to the interprofessional antimicrobial stewardship activities for that program. But they also say to optimize patient outcome, every pharmacist should incorporate antimicrobial stewardship as part of their routine practice. So it shouldn't matter where you're working, 
there should be something that you may, can contribute to amicurable stewardship. Uh, it's not only for farmers who are assigned in those areas. We're well positioned to be key participants in advocating and developing and implementing stewardship strategies. We're also ideally suited um, to bridge the gap between clinical and operational aspects. And we're also often regarded as educators. Where do I start? Well, if you're looking at a program, this often looks at things like here, we have the three C's for change. So conceptualizing what needs to be done, why it needs to be done, which we talked about a little bit now, but then taking into how do you do it? And then communicating that to your providers, whether it's physicians or others uh, who are prescribing that, making sure that the providers of many recurrents receive and understand the information. But then there's also coercion to impress upon leadership the importance to receive resource support for a program and also to have pressure exerted by thought leaders and other involved in the process to get things done. So this is for developing a program. Often the steps of developing that change and implementing a program, you have to gather and analyze data and establish a sense of urgency. So what are your local resistance rates and patient outcomes and lengths of stay uh, and rates of appropriate or inappropriate use of antimicrobial therapy? You often need to create a guiding coalition, so a group, that interdisciplinary group with physicians and pharmacists and others. Uh, and what is the reporting structure? Creating a vision and strategy, communicating what that vision is, empowering others to act, create some short-term wins. So what are some, what we call low-hanging fruits and interventions you can gain as a short-term win and, and get engagement from others, and then consolidate those and then produce more change. This is really about a program and it's a workshop and presentations and stuff. It's a little bit beyond the scope of what I'm doing today, but I'll share with you some of what we've done for measuring, gathering data, and some interventions that we we're able to implement that some of you who may not work where there's a program or be involved in stewardship directly can still take aspects away and how you can apply to your practice. So again, where do I start? Well, first, you do need to measure. If you can't measure, you can't improve it. Uh, in order to improve amicurbos, you must, you must be able to measure it. And so if you can do this, I would encourage it. Uh, for programs, they suggest to establish a process and outcome measure to determine the impact of stewardship program and on amicurbal use and resistance patterns. And again, that's important, especially achieving more resources and support down the road. But you also need to gather data to identify strengths and areas of concern and opportunities of improvement. Also, if stewardship is not the full area and time that you have available in your practice, and that if that time is limited, well, you really need to know where the pressure points are and the areas of inappropriate use are, because you need to be able to concentrate your time and resources that you have available wisely. So this allows the time to prioritize, again, to pressure points and potential interventions. It allows you also to evaluate the effectiveness of the stewardship program. Is it working? It allows you to justify the interventions and further support. Helps remove bias and subjectivity uh, from the factor into deciding where to start. And it gives you an ability to benchmark between hospitals or with other jurisdictions. So it helps you track over time what that desired change is and to make sure it's sustained. So it's important at a program level, but again, also at an individual practice level to know where to start and put your time and resources. So what do you gather and analyze? Well, there, there's different things you can do. You can look at amicurbal consumption. So how much amicurbals you are using based on patient days or duration of therapy. Uh, there's various articles to, that can give you advice on how to measure antimicrobial consumption. Could be what you dispense or what a patient actually takes, or it may be at a lower level of what your hospital purchases. Uh, you can also look at your top five most common related diagnosis or reason or infectious related diagnosis or reasons for admission with respect to infections, because you may also target the most common areas where antimicrobials are used and looking at are they used appropriately. You can look at antimicrobial resistance rates that we, we had done here. We, it highlighted for us we had a concern with fluoroquinolone resistance. You look at rates of C. difficile. So I'll give you an example here shortly of where that was a concern with one of our sites. Uh, also looking at the proportion of inappropriate use of the ivory root or orders not meeting guideline recommendations. So again, there's various process orders you can measure, and that's what I just mentioned there. But there's also outcome looking at amicrobial resistance, uh, readmission rates, length of stay, and, and such. So one thing we did here in Horizon and Vitality, so both our areas, is we did a point prevalence survey. Uh, it's basically a one-day cross-sectional 
survey of all patients admitted to hospital, identifying all patients who have received an antibiotic. Um, so we, we surveyed each ward in the hospital over sort of one day. Each hospital was one day, and then we just collapsed it all. Uh, but what we were looking for is patients on antibiotics, identifying them, what was the antibiotic, what was the dose, how long were they on it, what was the planned treatment duration, was it treatment or prevention, what was the indication, was there follow-up documented, and was that therapy concordant with guidelines? Uh, there's various similar methodologies of how you can do a point prevalence survey, but it's, it's a good way to get started. Most are published for review and use. Uh, there is an option to always complete it sort of offline using the methodology if you have to. Uh, you just don't get the automated reports. So the, the two big ones I know of that we've used are the Global Point Prevalence Survey of Antimicrobial Consumption and Resistance. This is a freely available web-based tool uh, to monitor antimicrobial prescribing. It helps you evaluate antimicrobial prescribing practices and find and identify burdens. It helps also to design antimicrobial steroid interventions and identify targets of where you need to change practice, targeting where usage is common or usage is inappropriate. Again, going back to the data you get. Um, and then if you repeat it, you can see where that change was, so you can measure your impact. Another one is the National Antimicrobial Prescribing Survey out of Australia. <clears throat> this one is, has a little bit more uh, better categorization of appropriateness, but you have your country needs to be a partner, and we just recently became a partner here in Canada. Um, but again, a lot of these are published, and you could apply them in sort of offline way. Uh, so in New Brunswick, we've done a few. We did one in 2012, province-wide, as well as again in 2018. Uh, these ones, they lacked really a broad assessment of appropriateness. Uh, we really, only about half the orders we could assess for guideline concordance based on the definitions. It didn't have really a robust definition of inappropriateness that, that we could use in all cases. Because uh, basically, if there wasn't a guideline available for that indication, we couldn't assess if it was appropriate. Uh, but it did help direct our guideline development education at the time and a limited number of target interventions we could do. The solution was when we went to the NAPS, the Australian methodology, which was much more thorough. And I'll show you a little bit of both. So first in 2012, we looked at all hospitals in New Brunswick, got to capture about 2,200 patients where 23% were on an antimicrobial. So total, we looked at 691 prescriptions. I won't go this in detail, but basically we could tell was it hospital community infections. It gave us an idea of what were the most commonly used antibiotics. And again, one in four were quinolones, which likely spoke to our resistance rates. Uh, we found out what were the most common indications. We also had a signal that 33% of our surgical prophylaxis were more than 24%. Uh, and a one in five antibiotic errors actually did not have a documented indication. Now, there's likely a reason, but no one wrote it in the chart. Uh, but again, 56% of the orders, we couldn't assess appropriateness because we didn't have a guideline or enough definitions for appropriate use. But we did develop guidelines to target the common infections. We did some education memos, uh, and uh, we implemented some limited interventions. So IV to pre surveillance audits, uh, some bloodstream infection surveillance, I'll talk a little bit later, and some limited perspective audit and feedback on some indications. So then 2019, 2020, just before the pandemic, we did the Australian methodology, which was a little bit more detailed. Again, they have more thorough appropriate definitions, whether you have a guideline or not, helping you categorize, is it optimal therapy adequate, so under appropriate, or is it a suboptimal or inadequate therapy? So, you know, the immigrant prescription is unreasonable choice, likely due to the cause of agent or cultured organism, so excessively broad, unnecessarily overlaps, so like a dual therapy that's not needed. Uh, or a failure to appropriately de-escalate, that would be a suboptimal example. Uh, so it could be suboptimal, inadequate, or not accessible. So where you had all these definitions, the amount that were not accessible were well less than 5%. So again, we repeated this. I had about 2,200 admitted patients to hospital, a uh, total of 648 antimicrobial orders. Most of them are in the horizon in the larger RHA, about a 50-50 split almost on which route. Uh, we had already done some interventions to decrease our fluoroquinolone use. When we repeated this, our fluoroquinolone use dropped down to 9.2%, but we still had a lot of broad spectrum use uh, in terms of third generation spalosporins and piperacillin-tazobactam. We also could tell again what are our most common indications. And document indication improved. It was now about 90% of the time we had 
talked communications on the charts, as well as review and stop dates, not as well, but around 60%. Our search report for laxus duration had dropped down to 20% or more than 24 hours. <clears throat> and when we looked at compliance, about 66% were compliant with our guidelines. And in terms of overall appropriateness, about 68% being optimal or adequate versus suboptimal or inadequate based on those definitions I showed you. And of all the orders, it was actually less than 1% we couldn't assess. So this gave us a bit much better picture, again, moving forward, and kind of looking back at where we were. And you can break this up to various hospitals when you run the reports through. I won't go through it all. You can also look at it by indication, just your numbers are getting down. So what was your guideline concordance based on indication? Uh, so you can see for UTI, it was about 50% appropriate. So I'm sorry I'm moving through this quickly, uh, but I want to get down through some examples of what we implemented in New Brunswick. Because again, now that you have the data, what do I do? Where do I start? Uh, so I'll go back and basically break this up based on the types of major interventions, similar to what I showed you that our guidelines recommend for stewardship and uh, just specifically go through a little bit of our own examples and data and how we pulled that out, uh, giving you some of the background. So I'll go a little bit about AMICRO restrictions real quickly, which what we have implemented here. A little bit about guideline development, where we started, where we got to. Some of our experience was start targeted standalone and education without an actual active intervention to make a change. Uh, a little bit about IVPO conversion, how we added that in practice, as well as micro real order forms, and then perspective on feedback. And this is really where the money is, where you can make the most an impactful change, because you're doing the education and tracking, but making an active recommendation on patients in a systematic manner. So in terms of antimicrobial restrictions, uh, you can restrict to specific prescribers, so the only specific prescribers can prescribe certain antibiotics, or you can restrict an antimicrobial class to a specific indications for use. Uh, we have a bit of both. Some can require pre-approval before you can use them. Some you can, some sites, they have the restrictions set up that you have a grace period of 40 to 72 hours of, and then continued use beyond that needs approval by somebody, whether it's an AMS team, an ID physician, or, or someone else. The thing with restrictions, it does require resources to implement, and you do need engagement. Uh, practitioners may feel they lose autonomy, uh, so it, it's not always the first place you may want to start with a stewardship program. Uh, sometimes pharmacy, amicable stewardship teams, or ID feel like they're policing. And it can create some challenging dynamics in, in terms of, well, you, you know, getting a no that you can't use something. Uh, but the, the thing is, is highlighting it, trying to improve patient care. Uh, so giving an option of what can be used and following along. So, it, But it is a challenging dynamic. So it's not something that could just be implemented in any practice. This is really a, a systematic and a programmatic level at, with a formulary. So in New Brunswick, some examples, we do have carbapenem restrictions. They're restricted for proven MD multidrug resistance or suspected multidrug resistance, where piperacillin, and tazobactam, and third generation falsborns and others are not an option. So that, that's for carbapenems. Uh, but it gives a grace period for use, but then continued use needs to be approved. In terms of authorized by prescribers, so for example, DAPT, here in our facilities, daptomycin, lanizolid, tigacycline, and septobiprol, uh, our fifth generation MRSA agent, uh, it's restricted to ID physicians or medical microbiologists. They either have to be the prescriber or they have to have had approved it or recommended it. So regionally, how we've supported this, we do have a regional antimicrobial prescribing policy and procedure. This gives a process for restricted antimicrobials and how that, that approval can be obtained. But it's beyond the restricted antimicrobials. It also has standards for appropriate prescribing in terms of collecting cultures, assessing routes of duration, using the shortest duration. So it, it goes a little bit beyond that to set a benchmark of what is appropriate prescribing. Um, it's not completely implemented region-wide in terms of restrictions. So we have them on the books, but we're not quite there in terms of uh, having it fully implemented. We're still working on pharmacy processes and ID engagement uh, to get this done. But people do recognize the importance. But we're, we're getting there. The next thing we, we I want to talk to you about is about guideline development. And th this is something that you don't need an AMS team necessarily. This could be a 
uh, local, like here, we have a lot of family practice and hospitalists that take care of inpatients. So this might be something that you set up a local guideline for CAP because it's something commonly managed. And so it can be done outside an AMS team or an IT service uh, if you get the right people engaged. But basically, it allows you to adapt best available evidence in national or international guidelines for antibiotics and how to treat certain infections, adapting them with your local resistance patterns. Uh, otherwise, you might be using therapy that's too broad, too aggressive. And so you're developing those, treatment, those local treatment guidelines that take in both factors. We started this in 2012 uh, for those common infections we identified from our point prevalence surveys. We had a focus when we developed the guidelines to minimize fluoroquinolone use. Initially, it started as a low technology using just PDF charts that we put on our intranet uh, that people could print. And so we started with community acquired pneumonia, skin soft tissue, UTI. So if you remember back to those charts I showed you, that, that's where the bulk of our antibiotic use was. Uh, so initially, it was a two sided handout in 2013. Then it went to individual treatment guidelines. And eventually, we had it, you could print it as a booklet, it was about 100 pages. Now we've moved to NA Microbial Stewardship app where it's on a, you can have it active as a standalone app on a mobile device where you can access it through a web. This is a third party NA Microbial Stewardship app. It's a Canadian company that supports it. Uh, they just have the structure of how you can get your guidelines into it. It's used actually internationally by multiple health organizations across Canada, United States, and even the WHO and some international sites. But again, it gives you easy access. They also provide IT support to help you do this. Um, but you can also rapidly edit and add guidelines yourself. So I'm not trying to sell it, it's just this is our experience with it. Uh, it has been quite helpful. So I can see if this opens, hopefully it does not cause a problem. But this is our intranet. So again, uh, we started with individual guidelines, uh, much like you might see here for hospital acquired pneumonia, these individual charts on that, you know, selecting a pair therapy based on patient's conditions and factors. Uh, but then with time, we've now moved to the app. It's really COVID that got us to do this because we need to get COVID guidelines out there. But now we have sections for guidelines, pathogens, and antimicrobials that we can edit uh, our guidelines. So if you look at community acquired pneumonia, um, you can divide up based on the severity for empiric therapy and selecting which antimicrobial. Like so, empiric therapy for a low risk, just amoxicillin PO. Uh, to you can also then work in calculators and risk assessment scores. So looking at the DSCRB 65 and scoring your patient to again take you through to those different sections of which would be the recommended antibiotic. Uh, so the, again, that's just where we've moved to. Uh, we still have our PDF versions available. They're a little bit more colorful now and broken up similar to the app, but just again to show you uh, how we've adapted. Uh, so again, this doesn't require an AMS program, and just look for opportunities to look, work with your local teams. Uh, maybe it's your ER physicians, your hospital is dealing with these common infections that they would like a local guideline. You can have standalone target education. I'll go through this a little quickly. There's different avenues for education. Uh, you can do five-minute updates at staff meetings. You can do organized larger presentations, uh, memos, targeted emails, internet messaging. We even did e-learning for a bit with online customized self-directed learning. Someone can take themselves through a presentation and do questions. This provides a sense that you're doing something. But one thing with the education loan, uh, the impact can be limited in terms of people changing their practice. So that's where that perspective audit feedback where you educate, but then you have people that are engaging and changing that patient's their care or making recommendations is more impactful. Uh, the other thing is you may not engage those who you need most to change practice, uh, which can be a, a limiting factor. So we, we use like some memos at first, and we still use these, these did you know memos, these little one page memos, uh, giving some pearls on appropriate antibiotic use. So this is one we put out not too long ago in 2019, about appropriate prescribing antibiotics in the four moments, kind of like the four moments of hand hygiene, the four moments of antibiotic use, does the patient have an infection? Did you get the right cultures? Uh, in terms of moment two, a day or two has passed, can I stop antibiotics, can I narrow? And then moment four would be what duration if you continue. Uh, so we do send these out still, but now we're getting a little bit more targeted where before we send them monthly. Um, we have tried large theme education and messaging. We had a guideline on managing beta-lactam allergies. And if someone's penicillin allergic, how do you assess that? Getting appropriate history and 
that you can actually still use a lot of beta lactams. You don't need to go to quinolones and clindamycin. So we we had a guideline that educated well. We did memos, targeted and recorded presentations, e-learning, and we did this month-long rollout. And we did pre and post engagement surveys. Did this change your practice and such? And people had a lot of interest, but we really didn't see a big measurable impact. Um, so again, now we've moved to more targeted messaging and things that are linked to active stewardship interventions. This is still important. You can't leave it alone, but uh, you can't not do it, but alone you may not get the change you are hoping to see. Uh, we did some messaging with our community pharmacists, and I'll just show you a little bit what we did there. Just again, showing that there is things you can do in all areas of pharmacy practice. So one of the things to be pharmacists who work in order entry, receiving orders from floors and the pharmacies, what can I do? Well, there are important things you can do from that level in stewardship. One thing you do is you process the first dose of antibiotics urgently, especially for critical care areas. So because time to antibiotic initiation can decrease mortality. So really important for critically ill patients, septic shock, febrile neutropenia. So, you know, the urgency of the situation should be minimized. We should be minimizing that time to first dose. Guidelines say it really should be within the first hour of recognizing septic shock. But in other circumstances, we do wait where the patient's stable. What's driving this is data we know where if we look at time from hypotension and onset by hours and the fraction of patients who are surviving. So this is why we want it within an hour because the, your survival fraction is very high. Uh, and when they did the study in Kumar and Associates, it's an older study, they actually found it about a 7.6% rise in mortality for each hour you delay. And when they initially did it, I think they wrote to five or six hours. So that's, again, you want to work as hard as you can to get this down. And so pharmacy is part of that process, is processing the, the, the prescriptions urgently, getting them dispensed, and having the pharmacy systems and process set up that that can be done uh, efficiently. Because again, improve survival. So again, this is just an example of pharmacy where you can do it from an order entry perspective. Also optimizing a dose. When you receive that order, is it the appropriate dose? Uh, so appropriate dosing needs to take into account individual patient characteristics, the cause of organism, the site of infection, and looking at our pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. And as pharmacists, this is where our skill set comes in in terms of optimizing dosing for patients. One thing we did here to help is we did develop a dosing tool, which is now in the app, uh, to recommend what is the perfect dosing of antibiotics for various degrees of renal function. So we just finished going over uh, just some educations that we've processes we've had. And, and so, you know, again, we highlight again what uh, we can do in order entry. We can process first dose antimicrobials urgently, especially for critical care areas. We talked about dose optimization. And another thing you can do from order entry is bug drug mismatch. Uh, again, to check those culture reports at the time of order, and, and if you can access your microbiology to see is it uh, is the antibiotic that's being prescribed, is it susceptible, uh, is the organism susceptible to that, or is there a resistance, or is there something more narrow? So it's just another thing you can do for order entry, uh, and whether you can flag that to the physician or another pharmacist to follow up on. Uh, so now we're going to move a little bit on to IV to PO conversion and, and what we did in our area for IV to PO conversion and what you can do. Um, so when you look at IV to PO conversion, what it has to do with the microbial stewardship, it kind of goes back to that right drug, the right route, uh, part of all the five hours with the right dose, right duration at the right time. Uh, so again, it, to be completely appropriate, in microbial therapy, a large part of that is having the right route of administration. So. Optimally, the root administration of any medication that is that which achieves the adequate concentration at the site of action uh, to get the desired effect without any undesired effects. Most patients admitted to hospital with severe infections, they're initially started on IV therapy, uh, and IV to PO conversion refers to switching from the IV to PO route as soon as clinically appropriate. And um, basically, a third of all inpatients initiated IV antibiotics are eligible for IV to PO conversion. Often we start with two to three days IV, followed by a uh, switch to the PR route for most patients. There's a few different types of conversion. There's sequential therapy where you replace IV antibiotic with this PO counterpart, you know, for a oral antibiotic that has well absorbed. So like levofloxacin IV to levofloxacin PO. There's switch therapy, which is conversion from IV to, to a PO equivalent that may be within the same class or have the same level of potency, but it's a different compound. So going from such as ceftriaxone IV to levofloxacin PO, again, levofloxacin being well-absorbed 
and uh, similar potency. And then there's step down where you're converting to an oral agent of another class or it could be the same class uh, where the frequency dose and spectrum may not be the same and it's exposure. So going from something like piperacillin tazobactam IV to a moxicillin coagulanate IV or PO, you don't have the same exposure or the same coverage. And so with the third one, the difference is that you want the patient to be stabilized and clinically improving, where the first two, you really just need a function GI tract and clinical stability. So when you look at creating a policy or guideline, often we select targeted IV antibiotics and those where there's a good bioavailability, they're well tolerated, uh, that early switch is supported by clinical data uh, in terms of which antibiotics and which indications and a dose and frequency that's equivalent or less than the IV formulation. And this is what we, is what we took into consideration when we came up with our policy. If you, really, the important thing is, why do we do this? Well, the reason why is because switching to PO can shorten your hospital stay. It can reduce hospitalization costs. IV antibiotics are often more expensive. So is the preparation and administration. And again, when you look at studies, um, most studies are restricted to certain antibiotics and medical conditions such as CAP, and, and, but there is evidence of you know, how we can switch from IV to PO within those. In terms of benefits, uh, there's patient-related benefits. So when you, if you look at catheter-related adverse effects uh, and leaving a catheter in too long, there is a risk of infection. So an example, that would be staphylococcus bacteremia, where treatment would be a minimum of two weeks IV therapy. Uh, phlebitis, thromboembolism, vein collapse. It also impairs uh, early and frequent ambulation. It can be linked to falls, especially in the elderly. And there's also could be toxicity related to the vehicle in the IV preparation. There's other um, advantages of switching PO in terms of looking at the nursing administration time, pharmacy preparation time, and again, the drug acquisition cost. But again, it, it's more than just that. And there's a lot of hidden costs in terms of IV sets, syringes, needles, and other equipment for the administration. In terms of patient assessment, uh, you really need to properly identify patients, diagnosis, and medications, or any contraindications to oral therapy. Uh, the key criteria, again, are an intact and functioning GI tract, uh, an improved clinical status, and make sure that there's no exclusion criteria. Some exclusion criteria in terms of diagnosis, uh, in terms of indications where we don't tend to switch to PO would be serious or life or limb threatening infections, uh, staph or bacteremia, endocarditis for most cases, CNS infections, osteomyelitis, again, most cases, especially early on, any undrained or complicated abscesses, uh, febrile neutropenia sometimes, unless they're low risk, or if you have a pathogenic isolate showing resistance to oral options. So we developed a policy and a guideline to help guide our medical practitioners. It put in their um, expectation that IV therapy is reviewed by 72 hours. Uh, it impacted physicians, pharmacists, and nurses, so it had roles for each. And uh, some sites to help engage uh, created automated reports that reports were printed to pharmacists and or the floors uh, that would print out listing patients and IV and microbials they were on for those target ones for more than 24 hours just to facilitate that daily review. So this is an example of the, our, from our uh, policy of the antimicrobials we target. We broke them up in two categories. So category one where the oral alternative is well absorbed. So you just need a patient with a function GI tract and clinically stable. Uh, and for this with pharmacists prescribing authority, uh, the pharmacists can go ahead and do this uh, basically self-directed on their own and communicating with the prescriber. Uh, we find for the most part our pharmacists work hand in hand with the prescriber calling them ahead of time, but they do have that authority just to change the route in these cases, where it's the same agents. Uh, for category two, these are agents where they're not as well absorbed, so it's a step down. The patient has to be clinically improving. Um, and for these ones, it requires a prescriber order, so the pharmacist would call and make that recommendation. So again, the steps to it, we want to make sure patients are identified within 72 hours, assessing the need for the IV antibiotic, checking the indication, uh, assessing to see if the patient can, has, can tolerate PO intake, review the patient's clinical status, so their white cell count, vitals, culture report, are they improving or at least stable, depending on the category, and then informing the attending physician if a physician order is required, and then monitor 
how the patient felt afterwards and document the interaction. One thing when you do this, it shouldn't just automatically be a automatic switch to what we see here, because again, there may be a more narrow option than the recommended PO agent. So again, always make sure that it's the best antibiotic choice for the patient that you're switching to, not just on automatic to that agent. Uh, to help improve this, we again, we talked about measuring, that it's important to measure that are you improving your process? Uh, so one thing we did for the IBPO target is we did repeated uh, one day points prevalence surveys about one to three times a week. Uh, serving patients on the target IV antibiotics over 72 hours because our goal is that they were switched within 72 hours. So each patient could only be included once in the audit. Uh, and if the I criteria for IV to PO conversion was met, then it was labeled inappropriate use. Uh, so each hospital site, depending on the size, would have to have 10 to 40 orders per site. And again, patients could only be included once. So in the end, we had about 280 amicable orders from about 13 hospitals. We did this in both regions, not just Horizon, but Horizon and Vitality. And our indicator rate, again, was the number of inappropriate antibiotic IV orders over the total, and that gave us a percent avoidable IV antibiotic therapies. Um, so the first time we did this, our baseline that we had was 40% province-wide, 38% in Horizon, our authority, 41% Vitality. And then we repeated this audit yearly and set benchmarks with the ultimate goal of getting less than 20%. And what we did is we would do the audit each year and give the data back to the sites to go back to the pharmacy departments and go back to the physician groups. Uh, here in our site, we would pre present right at the physician staff meetings. Um, and then what we saw, again, this was years after, but we saw improvements in the rate. And the red are the benchmarks we set with the overall goals. So the last time we did this was pre-COVID. After COVID, we haven't been able to get back to it. Uh, our plan is this summer, but you can see when rates went Hi, for example, on our site here in Moncton, again, meeting with the physicians and staff groups, we were able to get back down to the benchmark. Uh, same thing in other sites. Uh, one of our rural sites, Miramichi, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail soon, had a little bit higher rates. But again, with work and working with physician groups, they got down below their benchmark. And eventually, the benchmark for 2019 was going to go down to less than 25%. Uh, so just an example of giving data back and acting on the data. Uh, so the next one I was going to talk about a little bit is just amicurable order forms and clinical order sets. Um, this allows local guidelines to be adapted into the ordering process and, and putting that tool as an order set in front of the prescriber. Uh, it does facilitate adoption of best practice, but there's limitations similar to education. Uh, it's only helpful if it's actually used in practice. It may have a limited impact if it's not used you know, formally. Uh, and often there can be poor compliance, especially for those who need to use it the most sometimes is what we find. Uh, so we have developed them for community acquired pneumonia, diabetic fluid, is acute exacerbation of COPD, as well as MRSA decolonization and COVID. Uh, but again, it's, they're only helpful if they're actually used. So it, and you often need to get an intervention around it to make sure they get used. Some advice I would say is keep it direct, keep it simple, make it about the antibiotics, the appropriate baseline cultures and monitoring. Don't get too complex and lengthy with them. You want them easy to use. Uh, and again, anybody can do this. You don't need to be a stewardship program or a stewardship pharmacist. Um, just work with your local groups, your local physician teams, and uh, it could be a drugs and therapeutics committee. This is part I'm really want to get in a little bit more detail with uh, perspective audit and feedback. So this is where you're intentionally targeting specific infections, amicable orders, or a process to improve it by going out looking for them and making recommendations on a case by case, but in a systematic way that you create an overall effect and a difference on patient outcome uh, individually and as a whole, as well as looking at resistance. Uh, so I'll go over a few of the examples of what we did here in our in New Brunswick and in our RHA. Uh, a couple of them we published. This is one we did out of our Moncton site here. It was a clinical impact of a urinary tract infection management bundle in a tertiary care teaching hospital. Um, so this was a before and after intervention study we did before we implemented it into practice long term. And it was to determine if a UTI bundle implemented at our hospital would decrease the inappropriate treatment of asymptomatic bacteria, ensure that cultures are collected appropriately, improve also the antimicrobial selection and duration of therapy. 
So the bundle was first nursing education. We were finding uh, when we looked at baseline and some of the indicators that a lot of our cultures are nurse driven uh, without a prescriber order. Also physician education in terms of best practice algorithm, concentrating again on diagnosis, indications for culture and treatment. Uh, then the lab also as a bundle modified how uh, urine cultures were reported. So they're gonna no longer be reported for inpatients uh, except ER, ICUs, pediatrics, oncology, maternity. So, and again, it, it changed the reporting. The work was all done in the background, the culture, everything was worked up, the susceptibilities. But instead of just pushing out the culture result susceptibilities, the report went out with this little note. It said the majority of positive cultures in inpatients represent asymptomatic bacteria. Please call the lab if your patient's symptomatic and you require identification and susceptibility. Often what we found is that one physician covering would order the culture, but by the time it came back, it was in the hands of another physician. And they would just assume that it was ordered for the right reason and would recommend a therapy. So with this, it kind of gave them that second sober thought to say, is this patient symptomatic? Do they need to be treated? So it was an intervention that was first tried in another site in Canada, in Ontario. Um, and we decided to adopt it here and put it with a bundle. And then we also had pharmacy uh, as a perspective on feedback to review all possible urine cultures for pharmacists on the floors where this block was gonna happen, just to make recommendations. And again, this is sort of as a safety catch, just in case a patient's symptomatic and doesn't get treatment. So we looked at 276 uh, inpatients with positive cultures before, and then about the same number after the intervention. Uh, looking at the baseline, we were going in with 78% uh, of 276 cultures receiving any antimicrobial therapy. 60% of these are asymptomatic for almost 70% of asymptomatic patients being prescribed an antibiotic. When we looked at all the cases in terms of did the patient get culture when they should have been cultured, received the correct antibiotic if it was indicated and for the right duration, to hit all three of those, we were only finding that occurred in 11% in terms of hitting best practice. And then if you look at days of avoiding antimicrobial therapy, adding up all the days of therapy for asymptomatic bacteria, we had 781 days of avoidable therapy uh, for about almost 4.73 days on average per case. So we had a lot of inappropriate specimen submission. Uh, we had a lot of inappropriate treatment of asymptomatic bacteria, and it validated that this was an optimal target. So that we implemented the bundle, we did the education, that went over a couple months, and then we measured the impact. And what we found is that the rate of treatment went down to 57%. Treatment of asymptomatic, uh, the number of asymptomatic bacteria was about 50%, but so they're still culturing a lot when there was no symptoms, but the treatment of asymptomatic bacteria fell down to 16%. Um, best practice in terms of culturing at the right time, picking the right antibiotic if needed, and the right duration went up to 38%. Um, but the total days of avoidable and microbial therapy dropped down to 138 days. So down to about one day on average. So that was, that was a large difference. In terms of outcomes, we did look at cases of untreated UTI, sepsis of 72 hours, or CD for 30 days, and there's no significant difference between the two groups. Uh, so we didn't improve CD rates, but it, it might have been a numbers effect. Our rates at this site were already kind of low or within target. And there was no apparent harm to patients in terms of untreated UTI or sepsis cases. So again, a significant decline in the rate of treatment of asymptomatic bacteria, improved adherence to best practice, but more room to improve. Um, and we had one case of inappropriate treatment of asymptomatic avoided uh, for every two patients with a positive urine culture. So again, a, a significant decrease. Pharmacist interventions. Uh, we didn't get to quite the number of pharmacy interventions on each positive culture as we hoped. Uh, again, they were only able to do this Monday through Friday during regular coverage for those floors. Uh, one thing I would say is that when pharmacists chose to act, for the most part, their decision and recommendation was completely appropriate. Um, the one thing that stood out is when the pharmacist made the assessment that therapy was appropriate, and they didn't have a recommendation to change. That was the case where pharmacists uh, were most often inappropriate. Uh, so it's sort of that decision not to do anything, that everything's okay. That was where they would need to watch the most. So, you know, looking at this as a cup half full, my remark was to our pharmacy team was that when you choose to act and make a recommendation to change, most of the time you're right. And it's when you 
just sort of go with the flow and say, no, that all looks good. That's when you really need to be careful where there's some room for improvement. Uh, so overall, we, we, we try to encourage the staff that way and, and to do more because they can positively impact patient care. Next, I want to talk about our AMR Cribble Stewardship in Miramichi, one of our, uh, one of the smaller of our larger regional sites. It's about a 150 bed hospital. Uh, the site was recognized to have some challenges related to microbial stewardship and had high uses of broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, and again, looking at accreditation and engaging in microbial stewardship. Um, what was driving some desire for change in the area was higher than elsewhere rates of C. difficile and so higher than our national and Atlantic benchmarks. Um, also, again, they were using a little bit higher rates than what other sites are using for broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, so this example where we really looked at baseline metrics and chose an intervention to impact these. Uh, so after the baseline was looked at, some resources that were implemented at the site was a local antimicrobial stewardship committee uh, to then a, to look at adapting regional and provincial guidelines. We engaged a local pharmacist at 0.2 for or 100 beds, so just about 0.2, and also a local physician to work alongside that pharmacist to give support and also help communicate with the physician team. And then we provided nearby support from our site here in Moncton in terms of an ID physician, a medical microbiologist, and uh, myself and my roles in ID pharmacist just to provide uh, resource support to them to help, help them implement the guidelines and go over some of the tools and uh, the education plan. So, in terms of where to start, uh, we looked at infectious-related diagnosis, and uh, a lot of these slides are stuff are from Keith, no Keith Noseworthy, the pharmacist that was there on the site doing the intervention. So I don't want to take credit for that. These are this is Keith's good work, looking at what are the common infectious-related admission diagnoses to the site. Again, respiratory was standing out as a primary, and the goal again was to reduce inappropriate use of broad-spectrum antibiotics to look at reducing CDI rates and improving antibiotic use. So what we opted to do was a community-acquired pneumonia intervention bundle, uh, again, to promote education, put in place guideline-appropriate therapy, and then measure before and after to see what the impact was on guideline-concordant therapy, the utilization of broad spectrum agents and C. difficile rates, including some safety rate things, looking at length of stay uh, and clinical order set utilization, then going back to the team and communicating the results. So the education focused again around the guideline, uh, appropriate therapy, risk factors for multi-drug resistance, um, that what are the common microorganisms, and how to uh, risk stratify patients. So we did this a lot through memos, these like short little snippy did you know messages, uh, giving that education, and uh, also about the committee. And so we provided that to the prescribers. And the next stage, again, was a perspective audit and feedback with Keith on the site as a pharmacist, running a report, identifying patients admitted with community-acquired pneumonia uh, to calculate their severity score using a CRB65, and then reviewing their therapy to see if it's guideline concordant, and if warranted, make any recommendations, and then documenting that. So I'll jump right into the data. What we found is a baseline, uh, when Keith did the chart review and looked, about 16% of orders were actually guideline concordant, so lots of area to improve. Um, overall, before and after, the, the severity of CAP was similar. So we implemented just the education to start in the clinical order set, and then measured again just to see what was the impact of education alone. And guideline concordance went up to 54%. Uh, so a big improvement from 16% but still room to improve. And so this is where we were at 54%. So then when Keith started doing the perspective on feedback, where he was going out to see the patients and make recommendations, the guideline concordance jumped to 91%, uh, really showing the impact that pharmacists can have to improve in care. And most of the time, 80% of the time, Keith's recommendations were accepted, uh, showing the value of a team approach and the acceptance by the team. Uh, when we looked at targeted broad-spectrum agents and um, you know the impact of 
upon inappropriate use of reagents. So at first, the inappropriate use of the broad spectrum reagents, fluoroquinolones, TES, and ceftriaxone is 85%. With education alone, it dropped to 39%. And then with after Keith starting, it dropped to 9.5%. So a big improvement in, in decreasing inappropriate use. Uh, IV inappropriate use at 72 hours dropped from 38% down to 19%. C diff rates at the time were coming down probably for a couple of reasons, but and these these are small cohorts, so we didn't see a difference in secondary C difficile rates of infection. Uh, but interesting enough, when we looked at 30-day readmission rates, it dropped from 4% to 2.2% after the intervention. Uh, so again, it resulted in an improvement. It really uh, showed the benefit of having the pharmacists there for the perspective of audit feedback. Uh, again, increasing that guideline concordance, and also interesting to see the drop in the readmission rate. Uh, so that was done with community acquired pneumonia, and since so much was respiratory, the same uh, intervention was done with the QZ space COPD, and the same thing was observed. We had a little bit higher start with guideline concordance at 42%, education and the order set alone brought to 50%, but then when Keith got involved making recommendations, the pharmacist there went to 84%. Uh, so again, a, a significant impact of having the pharmacist actively involved assessing patients on the floor. Um, before I go on, interesting enough, they these are done as pilot projects and pulled away, and we remeasured where we went back. And when you pull the pharmacist back out, it drops down around to the 50% mark. Uh, so when you put the pharmacist back in, it'll go back up. So it, again, highlights the importance of having the pharmacist involved in stewardship. And again, with the physician, that multi, uh, that, yeah, having multiple practitioners and disciplines involved in stewardship really get that benefit. Uh, another perspective on feedback that we've implemented in Horizon at, at a couple of sites is bloodstream infection uh, surveillance. Uh, we did this here at our site and, and published a small paper on it. Uh, so this is an intervention where the microbiology lab notifies the ID pharmacist when a blood culture becomes positive. This is done Monday through Friday uh, during regular working hours. And the pharmacists here at our site will follow the case and provide recommendations for directed therapy, step down and duration, and is supported as needed by an IV physician, which is really key to this intervention. So very much a multidisciplinary activity. Uh, any staff warriors or candida, candida bloodstream infections become automatic ID consults, often with the ID pharmacists, getting some of the case details and communicating to the ID uh, specialist. So we looked at this 18 months pre and post uh, just to measure what the impact would be, looking at about 226 of bloodstream infections before and 195 after. Uh, most were urinary sores, and some of the benefits we found, we found that directed therapy was on average about four hours earlier. Um, patients were more likely to receive appropriate definitive therapy, so once susceptibilities were out, everything was reported. Uh, the permanent definitive therapy was 99% compared to 80% pre. Uh, step down to oral therapy happened about two days earlier, and there's fewer prescriptions for colones and clindamycin. Um, so there's a lot of engagement here, especially with the physician staff with this, and appreciation of having uh, an ID pharmacist come by to assess the case, also knowing that we are talking with the ID physician as well. And again, the acceptance rate of our recommendations would have been well above 95%. And uh, now, years later, that this has become a regular part of practice, uh, it's been rolled out to another site here in the Horizon. And uh, I can tell you, when if you're a little bit delayed getting there, uh, often the physicians are calling and looking for the pharmacist, the ID pharmacist. And uh, at this stage, a lot of this is done is by a colleague of mine, Chantel. So they're often looking for Chantel with her notes not there right away mm -hmm. to see what those recommendations are. So it's been well accepted by the physician uh, team. So just some final thoughts, anybody can do this. You don't need to be an AMS pharmacist or part of an AMS program to initiate stewardship uh, in your practice. There's little bits and parts that you can pick up and implement regardless of your practice area, if it's direct patient care or even order entry like we talked about. Uh, first look at your own practice though. Have you developed an appropriate approach to AMI approval therapy? I'm looking at those five R's. Uh, and is there any area of your practice where you can have an impact regarding that right drug, right group, right dose, right duration at the right time. Pharmacists were well placed to make impacts for patient care for AMR group and stewardship. Uh, just look at your practice and is there a way you can do that systematically looking at 
measures to see where are the pressure points that need improvement most for your patients. Also work with your local leaders, engage in quality improvement teams, and look and act on opportunities when they come up. So when you look at it, when reviewing patients for running care, is there, is there cases where you can look at improving and optimizing a dose, IVP conversion, improving guideline concordance, bulk drug mismatch, or duration? Again, most of us working in pharmacy, there's places we can impact this in, in our care or in our practice. You can also work in developing clinical course sets for your site and also educating colleagues. So again, there is a place for AMS and practice for most pharmacists. Just to give you a real life example in a not too distant pharmacy, um, this was shared with me. They, someone received an order uh, for a carbon pen of 500 milligrams PO every six hours. So what's going on here with this order? Uh, so the pharmacists clarified the order. They figured out which carbon pen the prescriber was wanting as well as clarifying it's an IV. And uh, they also, the patient required optimization of the dose for renal dysfunction. They ended up going with a neuropenum dose every 12 hours. They also looked into the culture and verified it was a multi-drug resistant organism requiring a carbapenum and that it was susceptible. And uh, the pharmacist shared with me after, she said, you know, I wonder if she, she realized the prescriber, uh, if that it was the mental health pharmacist working order entry that helped with her antimicrobial order. So just a, an example that as pharmacists, there's things we can do. So. Are there any questions at this point? Just showing a few pictures here from New Brunswick. So we do have nice beaches and a coastline. It's not all winter, but a couple of weeks ago, this is my family, definitely in the snow. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine it's amazing. Wow, it looks, it looks brilliant. Uh, so my question will be as follows. Uh, who is funding the, the antimicrobial stewardship? Who is, uh, who is funding it, uh, basically? Is it like uh, only involving pharmacists um, and who is actually designing intervention uh, so, for the project? Yeah. So in terms of uh, like, we're, we're still building on this. Like, I, I don't want to make it sound like we've gotten to where mm -hmm. we need to be. Uh, it, it's been a slow growth over years. Um, for the most part, in terms of do we have a funded program with dedicated frontline staff? Not quite uh, as organized as that. It started a lot with the the RHAs and the government supporting committee structure. And we have had a provincial and corporate stewardship committee over both RHAs since 2011. And so a lot of the work and in initial projects we did were off this ends of our desk for a couple of us who were ID pharmacists and we, where we and ID physicians who were uh, engaged to do projects and interventions off the end of our desk. So not in a programmatic model, but still trying to make change and engaging change and I showed you some of the changes we had with overuse of quinolones and stuff, but it was still limited because not having that fully funded frontline antimicrobial stewardship staff. Slowly in each RHA, they've now uh, given more time either between the pharmacy departments uh, or the RHA just to get a little more ID pharmacist time. Uh, so now we're up to about three pharmacists in Horizon with some time that we can dedicate to stewardship. But again, for a, an organization that's large, it's still limited, but it's still growing. It's going the right way. The leadership recognizes the importance. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a combined approach with pharmacy department giving more time in, as well as the RHA investing more into it, but not still quite where we are hoping to be, but we're getting there. And uh, my another question is, does this uh, program embrace all the awards or you started from certain awards? Uh, so we started from certain, uh, I guess in each facility, we've done things a little bit different. Like here in Moncton, we had the bloodstream infection surveillance, which was all wards. Uh, in Miramichi, when we started CAP and acute exacerbation CPD, it was sort of symptom specific. So a lot of it fell to family practice, ER, and where the patients went. Um, so it, I guess it really depends on the intervention. It's more generalized across multiple wards, not specific. And okay. your first question, you had asked who develops uh, the guidelines, I think, and stuff. It's very much multidisciplinary, again, through our provincial antimicrobial stewardship committees, as well as over the years, we've developed local ones and working interdisciplinary with ID physicians, medical microbiologists. 
it looks looks uh, looks uh, very interesting, and I'm hoping that one day in Poland we will have exactly the same. But uh, I think we we'll still have to wait a bit. Uh, I believe uh, um, we try not to um, say about that we have a problem, uh, and there is not a central national strategy uh, to find with the with the hospital infections yet. I mean, it's obviously something is, is being said, but I believe that uh, only a few hospitals in Poland are on the top of this. But yeah. most of them, it's like uh, rather trying to avoid talking about this problem. But it happens, and, and especially during the pandemic, there was a, a, an issue because, uh, first of all, during the pandemic, it dropped significantly because everybody was using antiseptics a lot, masks and gloves. And just yeah. after the pandemic basically uh, was like uh, going away, uh, people they do not comply with 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 uh, with, uh, with safety measure masks and gloves and, and antiseptics. It's not popular anymore, and infection yeah. went up like significantly. So, so obviously it's 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 it's, it's just uh, a, a, a typical picture which shows, uh, you know, when there is no procedures about cleaning everything and antiseptic, uh, the number of, of, of infection will, will, will goes high high. So 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 I believe, you know, it should give. Uh, politicians uh, an idea to think about for sure yeah yeah especially i th think the biggest thing is concentrating on yeah. uh patient outcomes and absolutely. impact on patients uh, absolutely more so than cost uh, cost will get their attention as well but patient harm and safety uh hopefully will also should be a priority get. absolutely yeah. So uh, uh, I thank you very much, Timothy, for, for, for being my guest and, and presenting this super interesting presentation. Yes. Uh, it will be recorded in a, in a video to be shared with, 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 uh, with pharmacists and, and, and doctors uh, who are like, uh, available in our network. And yeah. uh, uh, if, if possible, uh, would you be so kind to send me your presentation? I'll try to make it available in a PDF version for Certainly. people who are interested to, to, to have a look. And and uh, hopefully, like in in a, in the new future, we'll have some more questions about this topic. I believe it's now on the go. We are just planning a few projects uh, uh, with with uh, with our Canadian team and and, and Polish team here together mm -hmm. to, to to show the the problem. And we are even trying to bring some Canadian experts who can take a swap here in Poland and 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 um, map the the, the bacteria and, and everything in the hospital. So I'm hoping, fingers crossed for that, that we get the funding. Yeah. Um, we've done something similar like in Australia and, and Canada, but now we're trying to move a bit uh, to, to, to Eastern Europe, like Poland, yeah. and, and, and see this beyond the case, basically. Yeah. Well, so fingers crossed for that. So I uh, thank you very much for the for, for, um, possibility to have you with us and hope to invite you soon basically <laughs> yes i wish you best and please reach out again if you'd like to have an absolutely idea. absolutely i think this, the story is not uh, not over yet because we are just at the beginning of our journey here so so i'm sure that i'll be very pleased to 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 use your skills and talent and, and knowledge about uh, this project well we're still learning and growing so it's <laughs> but i can imagine you are like 20 years uh, in front of poland <laughs> okie dokie thank you very much then thank you take care bye bye now